Hello, hello, and welcome back, or welcome to the Yogi Roth Show. Thanks for joining, and thanks for all the love and support. This podcast, uh, we've talked about it every week, it's continued to grow every single week. We haven't plateaued. We haven't been one of those offenses that takes two steps back to take a step forward. Uh, It's just continued to progress, and i got to thank all of the listeners for doing that, for sharing it, subscribing, and if you have the time for reviewing it. It is a huge part of the podcast game because I believe that this podcast, hopefully will help people offer them some tools to impact and better their life and that's why i'm not afraid to ask for a little support there so if you can just write a review on itunes it actually in the weird algorithm makes it just continue to climb up the charts so uh thanks for doing that if you have the opportunity to do it also let me know what you think about the podcast if you want different guests find ways to improve it etc i am all ears hit me up at yogi roth on social media and if you've missed some episodes go to yogi roth.com slash podcast some really fun combos the last few weeks that i think will impact hopefully your lives definitely have impacted mine and if you're loving college football you want some more insight in college football go to yogi roth.com and sign up for the how great is ball newsletter that's right there's a newsletter where every week i try to give you three insights that i take from the road in college football They might inspire you, they might make you cry, they might move you, they might make you laugh. Who knows, but I'm trying to give you three unique things every single week. And I also got to give a big shout out to my crew, producer Stuart Gill, Katrina Kernichin, and of course, Max Brown. Um, They are kicking butt for me as this podcast keeps growing. So speaking of the podcast, today it is Bruce Feldman. Yeah, that's right. That Bruce Feldman, one of the greatest college football writers of all time. I think we can say that with legit authority. Authority. Bruce not only is incredible breaking news, that happens all the time, but he's brilliant with the written word. Some of his books you may have read, I have one right next to me right now called The QB, dives into the art of the quarterback, the Elite 11, etc. He's written a book, a New York Times bestseller with Mike Leach. He's written about the Miami Hurricanes, Ole Miss. You can find all of his current writings on The Athletic, uh, one of the premier sources for all college football and sports news. So Bruce is there. He's also on TV. Check him out on Fox Sports. And he joined this conversation today to talk about his path, his passion, where it started from. And for someone who's known Bruce for a long time, I've really wanted him to be on this show since it started. Uh, But not to talk about how he breaks news, but to talk about the why behind his craft. Why did he lean into journalism? What does he think about journalism? How about the humanity within the stories that he's telling? And of course, in the times we're in right now, does college football have a role in being a bridge between the dark times For instance, in Pittsburgh, where our heart goes out to everyone, the community where I went to college in Squirrel Hill, um, and some times of light, which are Saturday afternoons and evenings when great games are happening. And Bruce, he's brilliantly eloquent, and he's somebody that continues to inspire me, and this conversation definitely had a large impact on me. I hope it has one on you. So I'm going to get out of the way. This is Bruce Feldman, one of the greatest writers in college football, I believe, of all time, and somebody that I'm really lucky to call a friend. Enjoy. Really excited about this next guest. Bruce Feldman has been a close friend of mine for a while, like a reference in the open. So, Bruce, thanks for making the time, man. Always, always a pleasure to talk to you. Okay, so I always like starting here with people that I've known for a while, just because I think it's fun to see how we each remember potentially the same moment. And I wonder if you remember the first time we met, and I'm going to tell you my version of the first time that we met, and we'll see where we met out. Let's hear it. You go. You you get to go first. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, so I'm at I'm at ESPN Magazine. I'm based in New York, and I'm working on a feature about uh, your former great teammate Antonio Bryant. So uh, I was there. I think I spent a day and a half uh, in at Pitt. But what I remembered about that was. Uh, E.J. Borghetti, one of the maybe the nicest guy in all of in all of the sports business or in college football, his longtime SID, was showing me around, and we came across you. And I want to say you might have been a senior. You're definitely I thought you were one of the older older guys on the roster. And your name being what it was, well, I was good friends and worked with Yogi Berra's granddaughter, and you just don't run into other yogis. So I think I, I may have asked EJ if you were named after him, 
And uh, and I think he introduced me to you at that point, and that kind of stuck. Yeah, I love it. So I can remember way back in the day meeting you at Pitt, and, of course, I followed you and known of you and your name and, and all that stuff. And I think in college is when you start to kind of explore, like, what, do I, what am I really going to do? You know, you have that freak-out moment. You're like, okay, uh, career is going to end. Can't play anymore. Oh. What what am I going to do? And I had no clue, but I started to find people like you to just learn about and kind of creep on a little bit. We didn't have Google at the time, so you couldn't go too deep. Uh, but I heard about your career as an athlete and then your transition to athletics. And, you know, when we met, it was still like that college kid professional. And then it was me years later out in Southern California. My biggest memory is when we went out um, – for like a bite to eat at this place called Town, which doesn't exist anymore. And Town was in Manhattan Beach, and it was a staple. If you've ever been to Manhattan Beach 10, 12 years ago, you know what I'm talking about. And it's a phenomenal place. And we just sat and had dinner and didn't really know a lot about each other. I remember learning about you that night and being like, oh, this guy's so much, got so much more depth than you know, just football, right, which, which is already a lot. And uh, from that moment on, I was like, I think I'm going to be friends with Bruce for a while, let alone just somebody who you meet as a professional. And uh, and it's wrong true. I mean, I, I think you you got so much depth to you, man, and, and you, we get to see it in your books and your coverage. And I don't think of you as a college football expert. I think of you a guy like as an expert in humanity. I think you just tell stories as well as anybody. So that, that's my that's my first memory of you. Well, I remember I remember that night. I don't remember. I mean, I kind of remember the place. I forgot what it was called. Um, you know, I think somewhere along the way, and I want to say it might have been before that, I was working on College Football Live. I was in Bristol, and there was something we were going to do related to Pete Carroll, and I don't remember exactly what. It was something either slash philanthropic or off the field, and Tim Tesla on the SID there has been there forever and said, you know, you ought to reach out to Yogi Roth. He kind of handled that for Pete, and you were, you were, you were still on the field coaching. But I was like, oh, okay, because I was familiar with you. And I remember we talked for a little bit, and you were you. You were incredibly upbeat and positive. And, um, and so I think then, then uh, I think that was right before we had that, uh, that dinner at that kind of, you know, good people watching spot that there are in Manhattan Beach. <laughs> yeah, 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 totally. All right, so I want to dive into you on the, in this conversation, man. Um, you're known for uh, – you're probably known by – Known in a bunch of different ways by different audiences. You know, there's the college football, give me news right now, that follows you on social media, and whether it's in the season and breaking news or unique stories, and definitely around the coaching, you know, and the craziness happens, you're, you're all over it. Then you have, I think, an audience that loves you as a storyteller. You've written multiple books, including a New York Times bestseller. Uh, so congrats on that, and all the links will be in the show notes. Um, and then, of course, on television, doing sidelines. Uh, but I want to start because I think the only way you get to where you are now is you got this great command of the English language. So how did you begin to write, and when was the first time you fell in love with that craft? Uh, that's a good question. So I, at one point in college, I was an art major. Um, little known fat, a little known detail. Um, like I can actually draw reasonably well. I can draw cartoons, that kind of thing. Um, and that was really one of the only things I was good at when I was, you know, in high school slash college. So um, I was doing that, and I, but I kind of realized also I couldn't be like a political cartoonist because I just couldn't make it very poignant. Like if you needed somebody to draw a picture of Abe Lincoln spinning a basketball on his finger, I could do that. But, you know, to, to, to be somebody who's really good at, at what I was thinking about was that just wasn't in my wheelhouse. I just wasn't wired for that. And so – um, I did well in, in writing classes. I didn't well, did, did not do well in math classes or other ones, but the writing part was kind of there, I thought, for me a little bit. And I was creative. And, you know, when I was thinking about what am I going to do, I really didn't know when I was in college what I was going to do. But I felt like I knew a lot about sports. I mean, you know, I was nowhere near the, the athlete you were um, or anybody I certainly cover. You know, after – right before I got the ESPN, I played uh, receiver in a semi-pro football league, but it wasn't – you know, like there was no, you know, no uh, no thoughts of anything anything for me on that front. So 
but I felt like I knew sports. I knew, knew personnel. I knew who people were. I followed them closely. I was kind of, I cared about that. And so, you know, I'd sit there and I'd read the newspaper and I'm like, I feel like I know more than these guys, you know, and I, I'm sure there's a lot of, oh, there's a lot of readers now who read stuff and I know more than that writer. And maybe you do. Um, and so when I had the chance to make a little extra money, I, when I was in college, I worked at a gym and also on the side, I would work uh, covering high school football games for the Miami Herald and did that for a few years when I was graduating. I liked it. Um, and then one of the people who was working with me at the time was 25, which seemed like really old when you're in college. And he said, newspapers are dying. You need to get out when you can. Go to TV. Well, I didn't have any TV experience, uh, but I ended up getting some part-time work for like, I don't know, $5 an hour on weekends, learning how to cut tape and doing things that really – Probably don't exist anymore in on the TV side, but I did have a get a little bit of experience and was able to kind of parlay that into a, basically an entry level job at ESPN.com a couple of years later after some other really low paying jobs, and you know, the rest is kind of history. I mean, it just it doesn't feel like work. It really never felt like work, and I like the writing because I like the storytelling part and. Um, you know, there's other writers who are who probably are better with words than I am. I feel like I can be a really good reporter because I uh, like to talk to people and I like to go try to find out information and and I care about college football. I mean, I when I say I care about college football, meaning like I'm really into it. And so I should know who the offense coordinator at Southern Miss is or, you know, some of those things. I should know if I can, you know, what – the Utah State's head coaches, you know, like what his wife had done for a living. Like, that, I may not know anything about anything that's of, that's of adult value, but I can, but I can know about college football. And ultimately, that stuff actually helps if me do my job. And so now that I've transitioned to more of a sideline reporting role, I feel like whenever I go to a game, you know, whether it's University of Washington or Purdue or wherever we go or Texas Tech, I should know a few guys on those staff to be able to get stuff that. And hopefully other people who do what I do don't get. Yeah. When did you say, this could be kind of like a career? Like, did you have a moment where you were like, even if it was a decade in, we were like, whoa, like, this is kind of my job now versus have kind of just fighting from the Miami Herald to maybe some TV and trying to piecemeal this thing together? You know, what's weird is, you know, we, and I don't know if you feel this way because you grew up in the football world, which I didn't, but – I feel like a lot of times there's been stuff that has, has – it's almost like a little bit of like Mr. Miyagi stuff where you're around it so much it starts to seep into your brain. And some of the ways that like – you know, the Pete Carroll stuff, I'm not going to worry about – you know, like coaches who don't worry about what happens, their legacy, or don't worry about what happens, you know, four weeks from now. You just worry about what's in front of you. And that's kind of how I've approached everything. I don't know if it's just, like, how I'm wired or just because I've heard it so much, I've applied it to myself. Like, some of these kind of things that people feel like they're really cliche that coaches say, I mean, they are life applicable. And I'm much older than the people they were trying to tell it to, but some of that stuff resonated with me. So I really haven't even thought of, like, you know, career or whatever. I'm just, like, I feel like I'm just approaching – today and tomorrow, and if you had said to young me when I was struggling in school and didn't know what I wanted to do, hey, you'd get to do this, I'd be like, which finger do I have to cut off to do that? I mean, like, that's what I want. And, I mean, there's no, like, I'm I'm self-aware enough to know that, like, um, you know, I couldn't, I wouldn't be very good if I tried to do Kirk Herbstreit's job. I have a ton of respect for him in that role, just have a ton of respect for you know, Reese Davis in that role or or Kevin Burkhart and what he does and, and so many people like I know what I can do and I kind of know my I would say my limitations because I don't like using that word as much, but I know what I'm good at. I know what some other people what I think they're really good at and I'm comfortable with that. You know, like our like I'm on the B crew at Fox and Games. Our sideline reporter on the A crew is Jenny Taft. She's a delightful person, and she's very talented, and she's really good at, at at what she does. And I can aspire to be, you know, some of those areas where I'm not as good as I am at other things. Like I can try to get better at those, but ultimately, I know I'm probably never gonna like the things she's really good at. For instance, I'm never gonna be. Prob- I'm just not that way to be that that 
that kind of smooth and and the way my uh, you know presentation is. I mean, because those things matter. It's TV. It's it's how you deliver stuff and how comfortable the viewer is with you. Um, and that's more than just like how somebody looks. It's just how they are and their their tone and and everything like that. So it's just constantly trying to figure it out and get better and just get be the best you can be. And that's really all I kind of think about more than, you know, where does this fit in my career or anything like that. I'm just I'm just enjoying the ride. Love that. There's a lot to dive into there. Um, so I want to go back to playing wide receiver. Well, why did you play, and what was it like for you? So, I mean, I grew up like a lot of kids, especially on probably in – in like on the West Coast, I, I when I learned when I lived in Seattle, sometimes when when kids would say, "Hey, we're going to go play outside," they would play outside like in their environment. They'd go hiking or do stuff where you know that wasn't stuff. Where I grew up, it was basically you played football outside with your friends, or you played basketball, you know, in the driveway or wherever, or you you know played baseball. That was pretty much you know kind of the extent of it. And so I played football with a bunch of my friends, and um, you know, it was it was just. Uh, it's just that I grew up loving the sport. I remember the first football game I watched. And then when I was – basically before I got hired at ESPN, there was a semi-pro football league and on the East Coast. And I was – I had time, and I was curious. I'm like, you know what, like this would probably be fun to try to do, and I'm curious about it. So I went, and we had a run-and-shoot offense. And a lot of my teammates were corrections officers, or they were bouncers. And – I think we had one game, and then I got a call. Like, I was already talking to ESPN. It was, like, the third time, and somebody from ESPN called me and said, hey, can you take a drug test for us on on uh, Friday? And I could. At that time of my life, I could take a drug test. <laughs> and it it went it went well, and I started from there. Um, so it was I, – I, I looking back, it's funny because, um, you know, there's little things you remember, but, like, I wasn't the most – I wasn't very football smart when it came to, to, to things like that. Um, you know, now I'm trying to learn as much as I can. But, you know, when you're when you're at that stage, it was like, you know, our our, uh, our analyst, our crew is Brady Quinn, who, you know, is a great new quarterback in Notre Dame and has played in the NFL. And, you know, that's Brady's expertise is to know what he's looking at on film. And so there's questions that I will ask him um, – not necessarily for a broadcast, but just for my own curiosity. Why does this work like this way? And obviously, um, you know, there's such a different so to know it at that level compared to, you know, what you what you think you can pick up or different things like that. And you you may kind of – it's like knowing a few words of a language as opposed to being able to speak it you know, or understand it, you know. So um, I know I, – I know – I never think – no delusions of grandeur with any of that. You know, it's just, um, uh, just I love the sport, and I like to watch it. And just, um, you know, going back, there was just, there was never anything like that. I mean, I remembered uh, when I was at ESPN, I worked with Robert Smith, who was a great player at Ohio State and really good running back for the Vikings. And, you know, the area I grew up in, you know, people loved football and everything, but you just weren't around. Like, I remember telling Robert, you know, Maybe the worst player on your team at Ohio State, who's probably a walk-on, he probably was the best player in his county, right? And, um, you know, where I grew up, I had a good friend who I grew up with who played at Syracuse for a couple of years. He's a good athlete. Um, but he ended up transferring down to, uh, to URI, which at the time was called, one, you know, the 1AA school. I guess we're calling it, you know, FCS now. But, like, you know, I had friends who were 1AA players, Division three players, and – you know, it's just there's a ton of good football players, and you just kind of realize it, and then you realize, like, to kind of translate up, like one of the kids I grew up with who was a, one of the better players in our area, um, he ended up playing at, at uh, Lehigh, and he has a son who was trying to get recruited as a quarterback, and I remember, like, kind of trying to connect him with with uh, Brian Stump and some of the people we know at Elite 11 and just, just to kind of get in the pipeline. And you kind of reminded of just – how many great football players there are. Um, and so that's, you know, that's kind of my perspective on it in a long roundabout way. I love it. So take us through where you grew up, and I'm curious what your parents were like. So I grew up in upstate New York. When I say that, I was 
closer to Albany than than way way up. Like sometimes people will think Syracuse or Buffalo, but I grew up in Kingston, New York. It was a it was an IBM town, but at some point in my childhood, IBM left and really nothing replaced it. It's a pretty part of the country. Um, you know, I was one of those people who never had to change schools and everything, and um, you know, I had a good childhood there. It was like you know, I had good friends and everything, and everybody seemed to do pretty well. Uh, I didn't, I was not a good student, though. I was the youngest of three, and I was kind of struggling with that. Didn't know what I wanted and was one of these people who was like, well, I don't know what I want, and I wasn't really self-motivated for that. So I ended up, started out at my uh, my college at uh, Marist College. Didn't last, you know, I lasted a year there. Then I went to junior college where I played golf. Then I went to Albany State, and then my dad passed away early on at that in that semester, and that kind of really affected me. Um, and it was kind of a wake up call to just, hey, you better get your act together because you don't know what you're going to do, and you better you better figure it out. Um, and at that point, I I ended up my grades were okay, and uh, I transferred to the University of Miami, and I had. Uh, I never like I would go out one one time a semester. I mean, I worked basically two jobs, and it was like, okay, I'm trying to figure this out. I don't know how it's going to work out, but that was that was it for me. My dad was a small town doctor. Um, we didn't have a ton in common, and you know, I, just as an aside, I guess this is all an aside, but as an aside, um, you know, everybody has like a wall or in their house with a bunch of pictures and everything. And it's interesting in that, like, the one picture that was really in black and white was a picture of him in a uniform, military uniform. And I never thought really twice about that picture until uh, a guy I went to, you know, high school with, who after he went, after high school joined the Marines, and he came home, he came, he went back to Kingston, and I think he came over to my house, and we were going to go out drinking or something. He asked me a bunch of questions about that picture. And I didn't, you know, it's it was, I, you know, I felt bad because – it was right around the time, maybe it was right before my dad passed, or it might have been right after. I don't remember the sequencing of it, but I never really, like, my dad was a captain in the Navy and was in the Korean War, and honestly, I found out a lot of stuff, you know, I, from talking to other family members after he passed away, and I do regret not asking him about that. Not because, you know, I, I've heard this from, from a lot of people where a lot of People who had those experiences, you know, have been, served in a war or been in the military. They don't like talking about that. And maybe my dad would have been that way. I don't know. But I didn't even I didn't even bring it up just because of my own. Here I am, you know, had a career based basically on curiosity. I just didn't. Um, and I, that's that's a little bit of a regret, um, you know. And and uh, so he passed away when I was 19 or 20, and. Um, you know, it's, it's, uh, it, it, it just kind of is what it is, you know? So, um, uh, like my dad wasn't into sports. I don't, I, it's, you know, like I said, we didn't have a lot in common, but, um, you know, it's, uh, it's now that I'm a father myself, it's just like, even my kids as young as they are, they have questions and I don't even know how to answer some of it. You know, it's just, it's just interesting to, to become a parent. It just flips your whole world upside down. Yeah, I wanted to get that and, and just share some of your background with with the listeners, with myself, uh, because I think there's at, at the core of us when we express story, which you do every weekend on Fox as a reference, calling games or with the Athletic or in your incredible books. I think there's there's an element of us that is always going to shine through, which is which is our core, right? Whether you just said a career based on curiosity, clearly there's there's that within you, but I also think there's this side you that I've always felt when you tell stories is that you, at least for the most part, I don't feel you ever picking sides. I feel like you come in, you tell the story, and you say, I'm not going to make your decision for you. I'm not going to make your opinion for you. Do you think it's Dwayne Haskins or Shea Patterson, top quarterback in the Big Ten, or whatever the situation or story may be? Um do you agree with that around your style? And do you think that that reflects back on elements of growing up in upstate New York? I don't know where it comes from. I really don't. I do know that I've never been one, like, you know, the whole embrace debate thing. 
That's not for me. Like, I don't want to hear two people arguing about sports. I really don't, you know. And I have some opinions. Uh, you know, Brady and I will, will sometimes will will argue about something here or there. Not because I mean, Lord knows I res- I respect his opinion, you know, on 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 stuff, especially football stuff. But um, I just don't think, you know, it's rare when somebody's going to change somebody's mind, you know. And I leave that to the to the to the reader. I do think, and this is something that has changed. Probably I don't know if it's changed since I got married or it's changed. It's in the since I was gotten to my mid thirties or whatever, but I do feel like um, there is a part of this where it's like life is too short, and I, I, life is too short. Don't waste it on the BS. And so I, I do think there's so much negativity out there, and way more now than there was in five years ago, certainly. And a lot of that is what we see and what shows up on our timeline in social media or what, you know, may come up on on the TV news. And I do feel a sense where if there's a really sweet story, um, I want to tell it. I mean, look, I don't – it doesn't mean, you know, I I don't – I don't begrudge anybody who who tells it first. And, you know, I just think that that's that's part of right now a little bit of the responsibility. I get more now from – from that. Now, I'll give you a for instance. So back when I was at ESPN Magazine, I was a feature writer, and I would do what was co- what's called enterprise stories. And those stories are kind of behold- dependent on how much backstory you can find. Like, as, just to, to, for the listeners, it, man, it's maybe this is something they already know, but, like, when you do a feature or something on somebody, he's good is not an angle. You know, I mean, you can do it on how somebody's great, how great Tua is playing or, or whatnot. But the really interesting stories are when there is something somebody's over had to overcome or some kind of tension to it. And so, well, the better the backstory usually means the harder somebody had to, so the hardships they had. And what I was finding is, and there's a couple of stories that are very specific in my head for this, but like you'd be on the phone with somebody's mom or somebody's relative. And the more awful their experience was, it's almost like you got an adrenaline rush because you're like, okay, I can sell that to our editors and they're going to really be into this story, you know, because of what they had to, you know, overcome and everything. And after a while, I started to get, I was like kind of uncomfortable with that where I'm like, you know, you're just basically, yeah, you're trying to, you know, those things can be cathartic and those things can be uplifting in the big picture, and um, but I, it kind of flipped my perspective a little bit, you know, especially as you kind of grind through the ma- editing process of a magazine where you clearly live with a story for for a while on all the layers of editing. And so I'm gonna, an example I'm going to give to to the counter of it is Manny Wilkins' story, the Arizona State quarterback, and you know this better than than me certainly. But um, here's a guy who had all these awful things happen to him. Um, and what he's doing about it is he's using his platform. Like Manny Wilkins, to me, has an incredible amount of clout. And he has an incredible amount of clout because he didn't come from a lot. I mean, it's great when people who come from a lot do a lot and do a lot to help others and to, to help others on issues that aren't always cool or aren't always whatever cool to a to a 17-year-old. So Manny Wilkins is using this. It was like, it's great when – when Yogi Roth, the, the walk-on receiver at Pitt, is doing that and using his platform, how much better is it? does it look when it's, you know, Larry Fitzgerald doing it? Because, you know, it, it resonates with more people. It doesn't mean that, that, you know, we shouldn't, you know, pat on the back the walk-on who's doing amazing stuff on and off the field. But just when those people who who have that kind of big name, everything, it just has more reach, you know. And so I just thought – Here's here's something that really um, really moved me, you know. It just reminded me a little bit when I was in Mississippi working on my recruiting book. You know, I was around Patrick Willis a lot. And Patrick overcame this like as bad as the blindside story sounded in the Patrick story, it was even worse and even more dire. Um, and here he was. He 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 went into the NFL. He like. You know, I, I know just from dealing with him, he's a very gracious person in addition to being a, you know, fantastic athlete. Um, and that's motive, that's inspiring. It's inspiring not, not to say, 
I can go be Patrick Willis because, you know, God had a lot to do with, with that in addition to his work ethic. But I just think that when you see people, I think people, a lot of people want, just want to feel good. It's why some of those, those like viral videos of something very sweet get retweeted 75,000 times. You know, I think people are, are, are starving for, for rays of light and rays of hope, you know? So I think that ties into where I'm at now. Yeah, that's really well said. Um, I can remember I did a gig with Duracell where I ran around with Patrick Willis around San Francisco for the day, and I was blown away with the type of thinker he was, the empathy he had, the graciousness, how he remembered everybody's name. Like it was one of, it's like Larry, you know, Larry Fitz. Um, and I think those guys, as you referenced, completely shine through. So I, I want to ask you how you – when you find a story, right, you talked about – having to overcome something, tension to it. I'm curious for you how you've grown as a listener because you're one of the best in the business, and I think we would probably agree that that's where, you know, the gems are. Uh, how have you worked on that craft for you? And then even in terms of asking questions, because as you, as you said, it's not about, hey, how good are you? What's it like playing quarterback at Alabama? Nobody cares really about that, or that's not going to drive your story. So how do you, how do you weave that throughout your craft? Well, the first part of it is I feel like I know what people I, – I kind of know what can pop because I have enough experience. I'm not saying I'm always right, but I like I have an ear for it. I'm like, okay, I can see this will resonate or people will respond to this. You know, I can – you know, it's almost like you know what the equation is. You know what's on the other side of – what's on the other side of the equal sign. Um, the asking questions part is a much harder thing for me. So as a sports writer – you would sit in the press box, game ends, you go down the field, you ask your questions to either the coach or a player or whatever. You ask, if you ask a really stupid question, usually only you know it because the player or coach is just coming off a really emotional thing, and they probably are just kind of oblivious. Maybe they know you've asked a stupid question, but they're probably more concerned about other things. Uh, but nobody else knows. If I ask a really stupid question as a sideline reporter on national TV – uh, everybody's going to know it, especially me. And I'm, I'm going to know it before I finish the sentence. But And that happens because you're sometimes, I mean, this happened to, us, to me in the bowl game, you don't know who you're going to interview until like 30 seconds before sometimes. And you, don't, you know, somebody's in your ear. There's people swarming around you. It's just really distracting. You know, for people who, who like think uh, – you know, Aaron Andrews or Holly Rowe or, or um, you know, anybody else who's doing sideline is like, oh, they don't know what they're doing or whatever. It's like they can ask better questions. Yeah, maybe you think you could. You may even work in the media and think you could. It's like I can speak from a lot of experience. It is way harder. Like that is that is the hardest thing I've done in 25 years in the media is the on-the-fly interviews, on camera, around everything. It's hard. Uh, or it's challenging. I'm not saying it's like, you know, it's not like you're covering a, a foreign war. It's not like life and death, but it's challenging. And I'm always watching, like, when other people do it. Um, you know, I think Tom Rinaldi is, you know, he's not a purely a sideline reporter, but he's a fantastic interviewer. He's a fantastic interviewer for a couple of reasons. One, he, he often asks really insightful questions. And two, and this is this is goes back to a little of my Jenny Taft point earlier, his pacing and his delivery are really good. And it's hard to do that where, you know, you just got your energy up, you're you know, you just you don't want to blurt something out, you're just the wheels are spinning in your head. It's hard to have that kind of discipline and control to do that. You know, I think I know personally you've kind of messed around a little bit, you know, with the acting side of things. And there's training that goes into that control. Uh, Rinaldi, I know, was a was a high school teacher, so I think there's a it, just like I think John Madden at one point was a high school teacher. You'll get some people who have uh, developed some really good some really good skills because of that. Uh, and and so I'm always studying people for that and, and how little things how I can get better at it because. You're never you're never perfect at it. Even if you feel like you had a good session, I mean, Lord knows there was a game last year where 
uh, it was probably the worst interview I've ever done. It was with a player, and I was just, I think I was kind of off kilter just from, like, the interview I had with a coach. It was the field was kind of, you know, there was tons of people all over the field. And I started asking a question. I kind of lost my train of thought just as things going on around me. And it was, you never want to have dead air. It was weird, and it kind of threw me off from there. So it's uh, it's, a, it's an interesting process to keep working on. Yeah, I, I did uh, one year on the sideline, and it was it was definitely that. And I can remember even, like, prepping for, like, Chip Kelly. To me, he's always been the hardest sideline interview because you want to come correct. You do all this homework. you got to make sure you do. Um, and yeah, you, don't you, want, you, don't that, you don't get that zinger back in your face. <laughs> exactly. And we've all been there, um, and I think it's, it's great uh, as an example to, to, you know, I always tell young broadcasters, like, well, just try it. Hit pause, you know, at the end of the second quarter. What do you ask? Um, so on that note, do you ask what you think the audience wants to know, or do you go to what you want to know? I hope it's the same thing. I really do. I mean, there's a couple. There's one instance specifically um, where we had a Washington – I'm sorry, a Utah-Arizona game at, at – in Salt Lake, where Pal Whittingham, I think it was like his, and this was back when they had, you know, Garrett Bowles was a terrific old lineman. And they did have issues with their center. I want to say it was like a player who hadn't played center before. But they might have had like six false starts in the first half alone. And so, you know, what the heck's going on? And he was basically telling me that the, the Arizona D-line was simulating the snap count. And so he had told me about it. And then – well, here I am. I'm like, okay, this is this is definitely interesting. It, it impacted the game. So it's a night game we have, and I'm like, well, who do I? Fortunately, I, I kind of racked my brain. I know an O-line coach because I saw his team in the FCC had played an early game, and I called him. I was like, what exactly is the rule? Tell me how common this is or whatever. So I was kind of prepared myself for at the end, and even though the person I work with who's a sideline producer was like, usually, you know, I was like, oh, these are the three things, but his first answer was about, like, I asked him what changed in the second half. He goes, we, he, uh, Whittingham said something about how they shifted things up related to their cadence. And so then I'm like, all right, got to ask the follow-up on that. And normally when you're doing sideline, I feel like you may only get two questions. At the most, you're getting three. So to ask a follow-up where you're drilling down further into that subject is something that I'm not saying it's frowned upon because it's not like I don't think anyone's weighing in enough on that above you, but – it's just usually you don't go in that direction, but I felt like this is what I'm most interested in. To me, this is the biggest takeaway that could get traction out of this out of this report. Let me drill down further because Kyle Whittingham, he's not one to pull punches. I mean, he he's pretty blunt, and he was really good about that. I mean, he, was, he had really impassioned answers on it. So I was glad in that direction I did that. But, um, you know, like I said, it's it's a, it's a really interesting game of, of – of uh, kind of playing tennis in a way because a lot of times the uh, the coach really may not want to go in that direction. Even the player may not want to go in that direction. But you just want to see you want to see how they're going to react because you're supposed to be there to ask the questions that the audience wants to know. Yeah, I mean, I think instinct is so so big, and it took me probably about seven years in my tenth year doing games uh, to trust it, really trust it. You know, I have this story, or I have this question, or I have a statement I want to say. But everything inside me saying, hey, hold out, don't do it. But I want to get it out. I want to get it out. And I used to fight it. Now I always just go, hey, trust it. If it's meant to come out, it'll come out in the third quarter or it'll come out on a radio show uh, versus trying to kind of push, you know, the work that you've done. And I always think that balance, whether you're reporting or, you know, calling the game is, is always a, a, a tight one to play upon. Um, and, and I want to ask you that because you and I, uh, as much as we love this game of football and, you know, neither one of us, as you said, so eloquently feel as though we have to work a day in our life and we get to go do this. And, and I think we're both connected to the humanity around the game, let alone nerding out on the X's and O's. Uh, so I ask you that based upon what happened over the weekend. Well, I woke up Saturday morning, and you had an earlier game than I did, I believe. I was, walk- I was working the game with Wazoo in Stanford, but I saw an alert about a shooting in Pittsburgh. And I played a pit, as you referenced, spent a lot of time in Squirrel Hill, Um, and as that story unfolded, it became really personal to me throughout the day, Uh, different than uh, anything I'd ever felt, Um, as one of my friends, she lost her two brothers in that ridiculously unfortunate 
uh, incident in the synagogue. And I ask you as somebody who you have a great lens on the world, not just in football. When things like that happen, you know, where, where do you go? What do, what do you think of? I imagine probably your family right off the bat. But once you get through that and you and you apply it to your day when you're on a college campus, for instance, this past weekend, curious just your process of what you think about and, and how you go through that with this game probably hours away. Well, um, you're right. I had an early game. It was 11 a.m. local. It was it – was, uh, Wisconsin at Northwestern, and so I had a 9 a.m. interview with Paul Christ, and it was on camera, you know, as we were going to run in the pregame, and it was because uh, their starting quarterback was in the concussion protocol, and we weren't sure if he was going to play, so I'd ask about his status, and so not only was that going to be be uh, my you know, I asked a couple of questions about that for our pregame, but it was also that was going to be what my open was from for the broadcast. So I was kind of, um, you know, had to had to do that, and then I had a bunch of other stuff going on that morning related around the broadcast. So we were always it it was an unusual day in that because it was an early morning game, it was an 11 a.m. kickoff. Uh, I never had much time. Like I didn't really have any chance to eat breakfast, anything. It was just kind of like scrambling what was going on there. Um, so I said all that to get to this. So I'm not on, I'm not online very much, if at all, during games. Uh, usually, uh, you know, stadium Wi-Fi is not great to begin with. Um, I just, you know, I just, you know, once, a, once maybe a quarter I may go online. But I didn't that, that day just because, there was a bunch of stuff going on on the Wisconsin sideline. There were some injuries. There was just there was just some stuff going on. So I didn't go online until halftime. So I'd already interviewed Pat Fitzgerald. I was waiting for Paul Chris to come out of the locker room, and I looked online. And the guy I do our podcast with, Stuart Mandel, had a pretty impassioned tweet um, related to just feeling anger and kind of disbelief that there's this still this – level of rage and anti-Semitism in 2018. And it rattled me and to the point where I was like, I can't, be- I can't believe this. And yet I can believe this, um, that there would be this, I, I don't, there were, I don't think it was known that there was 11 deaths at that point. I want to say it may have been eight. Um, but to be honest, it's my worst nightmare. It's my worst nightmare. Um, when it regards to a mass shooting, it's on top of it. It's my worst nightmare as it's related to a hate crime related to that. And, um, you know, I had a, I had a hard time, honestly, the rest of the game being focused in on the game. I'm trying to, but, and, and that's not just, not just not Saturday afternoon. That's actually stayed with me, um, to now. Um, you know, when I do games, I usually don't try to look at social media because I don't want something that that is happening outside in the real world maybe to impact me in some way. Uh, I forgot. I want to say that there was a, uh, a tragedy in Europe at, like a year earlier, and there's nothing you can do about it except, you know, it's like when you're, you know, you have a job to do and you got to find your way to, to focus on that. If you're so distracted by what's going on, um, you know, you're not going to be able to do it. And so I try not to, you know, even if it's something that's like petty or not, not a tragedy like that, you're like, you get up, you get distracted or pissed off by something you see or something like that. I'm like, you know, that's not going to help me. Um, uh, but in this case I did see it. Um, and I couldn't stop thinking about it. And, um, you know, I haven't really, you know, I've thought about it a lot since it's just, you just look at it and go, and this is this is you know despicable and it's sad, um, and you would just hope that people um, not just come together, but just um, can say, hey, look, this isn't who we are as a society. This isn't you know, this isn't um, this shouldn't be us as a, as the United States, and there shouldn't be any tolerance for this kind of. Like, you know, I think I had seen something the night before because there was all those bombs, you know, the uh, the uh, the pipe bombs or whatever they were. And I watched somebody, 
who worked with that that man, and they were kind of explaining who he was and whatnot, and just it's just sad when there's people that are so consumed by hate that there's no rationality to it, and that somebody then acts on it. Yeah, I mean, you got the fortunate to to go home to your beautiful, you know, babies, and as they continue to grow, and we both are fortunate to go to a college campus pretty much every weekend for half of the year. What role do you think sports, specifically even college football, has or can have in the world right now that we're in with you know, so much negativity and anger um, that we see everywhere, regardless of which side of the, of the ledger you want to lean towards? Well, I just hope that, that you know, with, with college sports, you know, you have 100 people on a team, and there's a lot of – there's a lot of um, – there's a lot of different paths people have taken. You know, Chris Peterson is one of the more fascinating people I've ever, ever covered. Uh, last spring, I had talked to him. I was there for – I wasn't sure for what exactly, you know. I, I was there to work on some story, but we got into this long Q&A uh, conversation that I thought this is going to be an interesting Q&A because it was really about how he deals with real-world issues with his team. You know, at one point he was telling me early on, he said, you know, a lot of my players last year were really worked up about the election. I said, okay, let's talk about it then. So he has a team meeting. He goes, first off, I want to – everybody who voted, raise your hand. He goes, like, eight guys raise your hand. I was like, okay, everybody else will leave. You eight, you eight stay. You eight, we can talk about this. You didn't vote. You know, basically, you, you don't have the right to say anything about this. And, I mean, I'm paraphrasing that, but – his his perspective and his approach was, I thought, pretty awesome in how he views things. I have a ton of respect for him, not just because he wins a lot of games, but because of what I think he's about. And they have kids from all over the place, different backgrounds and everything else, different upbringings. And I think when you know, when you know people uh, who have, who are different or different than how you were raised, and, and and maybe it's just like the word ignorance sometimes has really nasty and negative connotations, um, but there are people who can be ignorant of something just because they don't have an awareness of it, and they don't have an understanding of it. doesn't mean it's malicious. They just don't know. But sometimes when they're exposed to people who are, quote, unquote, normal, just they're different, um, that changes their opinion of things and it, it gives them perspective and then they they can have a much better understanding of things and so i think when you have that um through the lens of college football and hopefully for a lot of people um they can be exposed to that because college athletics and athletics in general can bring people from all over the place like to me one of the most um most reasonable, intelligent, uh, real leaders that we have, you know, through sports is Bill Curry. Um, you know, there's been coaches who certainly won a lot more games at Alabama and other places, but I don't think there's anybody who stands for more character and, you know, and just has a handle of the big picture in the real world. And he's a guy who played for Bill Lombard, Vince Lombardi and all these, you know, certainly, uh, you know, played on some great teams. But you see there's a lot of wisdom in that. And, you know, he had a he had a book about the people you meet in a huddle. And just I, I think that stuff is really important because everything now, sadly, is so divisive. Now, you, make, you, you can make um, compassionate comments, and yet on Twitter, it's the ultimate un, you know, overturned rock. There will be some person or some people who will take offense at that. Because they think if you're talking, it's like you're 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 poking them or somebody they believe in in the eye. It may not be about that. Now maybe it, it might be about that. I can't speak for every you know, every person who says everything, but I think sometimes it's just like, um, you know, everything is like a is like an open wound right now. Yeah, yeah. I, I think back to you know your story about playing semi pro wide receiver and. All the people you line up next to, I can remember, you know, here I was, a kid from the sticks in Pennsylvania. Mom's a refugee, brother's gay. Guy, my roommate was right wing. 
my locker mate was from the South, African American. Like, I really think when you're on a team, like, you don't, you, you don't have these big blocks that maybe were around you growing up, right? Because of your community and you can just knock them down. And I think that's what athletics does. And, and I think in college athletics, you know, right now, it's what an interesting time because the conversation I always ask kids every week, I was it like going to class. It's like walking on campus. Um, and it's really interesting to, to hear the dialogue. And I share that with you, Bruce, because I'm curious, do you, or where do you, where do you lie on the concept of using your platform? I mean, you clearly you do it and tell great stories. Uh, we see those every week in the athletic and other, other platforms. But do you feel like with where humanity is now, because you have such a loud and, and large microphone, even though your community thinks it's always college football, do you, do you kind of waver and maybe stretch a little bit more now than you would a couple of years ago? Um, I try. I, I'm, I'm very mindful of that. You know, I'm uncomfortable talking about those those issues because I know a lot of people only care about, you know, for, you know they follow me for college football. They don't want to hear some of those other things. I struggle with that um, with, with even some of my friends who may not agree with me on things or may not have the same perspective because I don't think they, you know, those things are uncomfortable for people when they get challenged on those issues, right? So, um, you know, I try to respect that. At the same time, you know, it's not a focus group. Your time, your Twitter timeline, your social media profile is not. I mean, it's yours. Um, And so I think there's things, look, I mean, I don't know where you stand on every issue politically, Yogi. I don't know where a lot of I, the guy I host the podcast with. I know him really well. I don't know where he stands on. Like, there's certain issues that I'm really conservative on. There's certain issues that I'm not conservative on. Like, I feel like in this day and age, everybody gets labeled and put into a into a little box that it isn't always that way. But people make some real assumptions. You know, um, you know, I could retweet something from Bill Curry or I could retweet something from, uh, you know, Dan Wykey, who's a friend of mine who covers the NBA for the L.A. Times. And people will automatically assume I'm really liberal when I'm actually not. I mean, especially when it comes to some issues. But that is that is um, just how people see the world now on social media. They don't, you know, real, reality-wise, they don't know you or me or Joel Klatt or or uh, Jeremy Bloom or Matt Leinert or, or, you know, whoever we work with. They see a, they see a snippet of you just like, um, you know, it's just that's how it is. I mean, I think sometimes people surprise you with their opinions. I mean, look, I have – I have there's people I know a little bit in sports, either who I covered or, you know, just kind of know through TV, who I'm actually surprised where they are politically. And that goes on, on you know, whether they're Republican or Democrat or conservative or liberal. Um, you know, it's hard to, to, to judge all books by all covers. And, you know, it's it's just, um, you know, I think people want to do that. And, I, 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 you know, I mean, I can think of an example right off the top of my head of like somebody I'm like, man, I would have thought this person was that way just because of how they, just because of my image of their persona. And then I find out they're really not that way. Um, They were kind of the opposite. And, um, but again, sometimes, you know, I think you got to do what's in your heart. You got to be true to who you are. Uh, It's a lot easier for me to, to try to tell a David Montgomery story about the good things that the Iowa state running back is doing to impact people or, you know, what Josh Perry, who's an old Ohio State linebacker, um, what he's about. Uh, you know, I think that I think that may be the best way I can I can uh mostly get my point across because that's it's it's not necessarily about me getting my point across. It's more about me using my platform to I think make things a little better. Because I just think I just think we need that. I mean I really think we need that on a lot of levels. There's just so much negativity and so much so much crap out there. And, you know, I, I think that, um, you know, I hope that the, you know, the David Montgomery's and the Manny Wilkins and the Josh Perry's and, you know, you can go on down the list, 
they they um, kind of give give birth to lots of other versions of them who are going to help change the world for good, you know, because you can, you know, you can see things and go, man, there's a lot of stuff that needs, needs help. And, you know, you and I both weren't, you know, really around in the, in the sixties when there was all this, um, all this just upheaval and, and so many issues. And there's, there's lots of stuff in our history that has been very, very uh, tragic. And so I think there's, you know, needs to be perspective on that, but at the same time, it's like, you know, we can always be better. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. Um, yeah, whenever that happens to me, I always think, all right, how can I elevate the conversation? You know, and just because to your point, there is somebody doing a lot of great in the world, and if that's the story that we tell, then yeah, I think people will read the writing on the wall to a certain degree of, yeah, there's there's goodness out there, and we see it every weekend. You know, for every college football team, for the one or two kids that maybe get in trouble every once in a while, or you know, coaches are having a discipline. There's 98 others that are fascinating, and I always say before every game, my job is to celebrate the game, which are the combined 210 student athletes on both respective sidelines per se, and coach the viewer and try to teach a little bit. Um, and, and I and I get a lot of that from your stuff. So before I let you go. Um, I want to kind of finish off with a couple quick questions for you. We've talked about a lot. Um, we've talked about talking. We've talked about writing. We've talked about some of your books. Um, I'm curious, where do you get where, – where do you gain your knowledge? Like, where do you go to gain insight? Because is it always fellow writers? Is it more conversation? Is it things outside of sport? Is it history? I'm curious how you're sharpening your sword. You know, I'm always trying – you know, I, I try to read a lot of, of college football stuff. Um, there's a lot of good people out there, and I try to read what I can. You know, it's not like I, oh, I, I always read this person or, you know, whatnot, but you, what I, what interests me, there's, you know, you try to be very uh, efficient once you can go down the road. I'm not going to read a, you know, a 10,000-word story on something unless I'm really, really passionate about the subject. But, but uh I'm there, and quite honestly, I've spent a long – when it comes to my job, I've spent a long time building up a big Rolodex. I mean, I will contact coaches and people I know because I feel like uh, sometimes somebody may write something. Some say coaches won't lie or give you misleading information. That could definitely happen. But I just think a lot of times uh, – you know, we did a game earlier this year, and what I try to do is I will try to call somebody who played that – those one of those teams to get their perspective there's no really incentive for those people to lie and you know you just get an ultimate expert opinion because those people lived it those people you know prepared for it they did you know whatever so i'm i'm always trying to cultivate and and develop what i know i have as a resource because i think it's important and just i'd rather know you know there's enough people i know who i have really strong you know, connections to that, that, uh, you know, what I'm, if what, if what I'm thinking, I'll be like, Hey, I'm not going to quote you by this off the record. You know, is this right? Or is this hype? Or is this whatever? Usually you get a pretty, what you think is a pretty honest answer. And if it's, I want to know, they'll be like on the record, off the record. Well, both. And if you tell me off the record, what, what's out there is kind of BS. I don't want to wade into that. I may not, I may not call you know, you don't want me to call it out as BS. That's fine. But I'm not going to put that out there then because I, because now I know that it's not all that people think it is. So it's all about just kind of you want to know as much as you can, and you also want to have as, an, as a really smart opinion as you can. Yeah, I love it. Okay, finish the sentence. It all comes down to the work. It all comes down to the work because – for, at least for my job, it's like, how prepared am I? How thorough is it? Just, it all comes back to the work. I mean, there's very few things in this world where you can wing it from, from sitting on your butt and make it work. I'm sure there are some things like that. I just don't know what they are, you know? And so the difference is, is the work and the preparation you put in, the attention to detail. I mean, so... You know, yeah, it's like I think by doing that, you probably have to have the passion for it. But um, I just think if you care about it, you can get good at it. Well said. 
What right now, Bruce, at this stage of your career, you've written multiple books. I'm literally staring at one of them in my office called the QB, which I love around the art of the quarterback position. Uh, what are you now seeking? Uh, just to be better at what I do, really. I mean, like I've been fortunate in that it feels like every five years I've kind of had a career shift. You know, early on I was just trying to get established in, in sports, and then I was trying to get established as a feature writer for magazines. Then I was trying to get established as a newsbreaker. And then I was trying to get established as kind of a multimedia, you know, person. And now the last five years I've been trying to get established as a sideline reporter. And so I like that. And I have my hand in a bunch of different areas. And I think that's that's great. I'm happy about it. I want to just kind of keep getting better at it. And, you know, my employers um, have trusted me, and I want to – be as valuable like when I do a game or, or whatnot like I know it it helps if I can be more accessible and and provide information to the people I work with in studio if I can help them that's a good thing for Fox you know or if I can help some of the younger writers I work with at the athletic that's a good thing for them so it's just um it's just about just like how can I how can I be better and how can I how can I be more um, more impactful. And finally, we've asked everyone who's come on this podcast the same final question, Bruce. How do you feel about the word limits? Uh, I don't like it. I mean, it's one thing to 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 know what you, to know what you um, to be self aware, but if you had told me. That I would be a sideline reporter on like big on big college football games uh, 15 years ago, I'd be like, that's impossible. I don't know how to tie a tie. I didn't learn how to tie a tie. Yogi saw I was like 37 years old. <laughs> um, so, and the guy who who would do ESPN news hits, I would wear a dress shirt, you know, and go to a, a studio in Culver City, and there was a lot of work there. You know, it's just like when I say a lot of work, I mean, there was a lot of need for improvement and different things. And so um, so the limits part, you know, if you ask me to dunk a basketball now at my age, no, I know I can't do that. But but otherwise, I mean, I just don't think it's good to uh, good to to think that way. It's just not. I mean, what good does it do? I mean, you yeah, do you want to be self-aware? Yeah, I mean, and maybe I'm talking out of both sides of my mouth with this, but I just think you got to keep keep trying to figure it out and and go forward. I love it. Well, uh, I know you don't have a lot of time in college football season, and I appreciate you making it, man. I've admired your work for got almost two decades, man. But uh, I've really cherished the friendship um, as as we've gotten tighter. So thank you, man, and uh, best of luck the rest of the season. Same to you, Yogi. It was a pleasure to be on with you. All right, brother. All right, there it is. Bruce Feldman. What a great guy. Um, like we talked about off the top, you know, he and I go way back. We can talk about, you know, everything from college football to travel to politics to humanity. And I think you got a little bit of everything there. Now make sure you go to BruceFeldman.com to check out his content. It's phenomenal. His books, The QB, The Making of a Modern Quarterback. Um, he follows the late 11 for the course of a year, talks really in-depth around the position. He wrote a book called Swing Your Sword with Mike Leach, which is phenomenal, especially in the season that Washington State is having. Meat Market, Kane Mutiny um, are the other books that he's written. His content is, is incredible. All over The Athletic, watch him on Fox Sports. Follow him on Twitter at Bruce Feldman, CSB. And make sure you are continually following this podcast. If you have questions, you got thoughts, hit me up. On social at Yogi Roth. If you missed any podcast, go to yogiroth.com slash podcast. And if you want some college football content every week, I got the How Great Is Ball newsletter where I try to bring you three different insights in major college football. All right, that's it for now. You know how we end this thing. The only limits that we have in life are the ones we set ourselves. Peace.